guys and welcome to the grand finale of Final Fantasy 13. Our journey has come to an end. We have finished the game and we have a lot to discuss about this one, don't we? Because you knew what was coming and I didn't know. And for those of you who didn't know what was coming, you're in for a wild ride, my friends. A wild ride because nothing, nothing in the game could have prepared me at all, despite the madness we've been through for this conclusion to the base game story. And don't worry, 13.2 and 13.3 are going to be coming. Have no fear, because I want to know more. I really do. Okay. <clears throat> As similar to yesterday, getting to the end is yet another slog. I returned from my excursion into having a look at the end game, which is a lot of grinding. In fact, it turns out to be even more grinding. Um, and decided to plow forward, which involved defeating the three whatever they are <laughs> they are some sort of empresses made of stone metal whatever different colors uh that have pathways within this sort of very bizarre allegan style area and you sort of proceed by basically fighting bosses after bosses it's, it could essentially be a boss gauntlet they are trash mobs but they're very very difficult uh, lots of very dangerous mobs so good seven six seven minute fights like uh, regularly i was finishing these fights with five stars and the prediction was like this should be eight and a half minutes and i'm like jesus christ man <laughs> this is brutal absolutely brutal uh but plowed through them and killed those bosses and then came to the finale boss, which is often. I'm skipping over some stuff, but it's not particularly relevant. So, we stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Bartholomew, the big bad emperor man. Uh, the bad pope of death, evil priesty guy. And our first boss fight will be against him. This was fine. Actually had no issue with this. Uh, relatively long, but not a big deal. Um, took him down, very similar to his earlier boss fight in the game, which took place in uh, Urba. Uh, so we've had fought him before. Very similar mechanics. Knew what was coming. And swiftly uh, dealt with him. He then sort of merges with a creature. And it comes out of a pool... And it's like an uh, unknown foe or something like that. And he's like, I'm here to kill you all. Uh, fulfill the prophecy. And it's, of course, Orphan. And Orphan, for those of you who have forgotten, is the entity that is making Cocoon float above the planet. Orphan is powering the whole place. It's essentially a battery. He's powering Cocoon. And, and I just want to point out how annoying this is from knowing what's going on in the story. At no point, at no point at all in the next four hours that we're going to spend in this room, does any of the protagonists mention that killing Orphan is probably a bad idea. <laughs> because it should result in millions of deaths. In fact, as far as I'm aware, the deaths of every remaining human life on the planet will die if we kill Orphan. Not to say they aren't aware of it, but their solution, as Vanille points out regularly, is that miracles will happen, wishes do come true, and somehow it'll all work out. And that's what we're going with, because it's brought up many times that, that it'll all work out. We just, we can do the impossible. We can make it happen. Wishy-washy power of friendship thoughts will somehow prevent this giant monolithic country-sized orb from smashing into the planet without the source of power needed to keep it afloat okay nobody even remotely goes should we be doing this like you would expect that in ff14 for sure like this is a bad idea we need a plan before we do this because once orphan's dead the cocoon's going to crash into the planet we should come up with some idea some uh, we need your solar to find ether from somewhere and then ether will make it happen right <laughs> whatever but that's not mentioned okay let's bear that in mind going forward so um i have to without um yeah with without regret really i have to say the next boss is a flat zero out of ten and the worst final fantasy boss i've ever fought this is often one Orphan 1 would be a pretty decent boss, like maybe even a 9 out of 10, 8 out of 10, because it's intense, it's uh, relentless, it's got really nasty overlaps and mechanics, it uses its mechanics in not random order, but a disassociated order, so that sometimes they'll do them this time, there's no tells for certain mechanics that are coming, 
it has ridiculous things. So it essentially revolves around two phases. And you can see this with the wonderful model of the boss. Uh, which is on the right side. The blue side is sort of the Bartholomew side. And then the left side is kind of the orphan side. And phase one uh, is kind of like slow damage with some massive bursts of damage. So what you can do there is, of course, time your paradigm shifts. And you have to use all the paradigms here to swap to healing and heal up really quickly, either with double or triple medic, get the team up, and then go full on relentless assault bash into the boss as quickly as possible to get the stagger phase because it has an enormous amount of health uh, i will tell you now the total fight time to kill this was 25 or 27 minutes of one boss fight it was a long fight i will say i got zero stars on it which i'm not surprised by um you can do it shorter obviously like you know people started talking i know in the chat a lot of speedrunner tech was being talked about things you would know after your first kill needless to say not relevant to what does this boss do? Let's try and kill it. <laughs> um, it then has a second phase, which swaps with a sort of gravity-based spell, which reduces the HP of the entire party to one. And then it'll change phases to a debuff-orientated phase, where an orb will constantly be debuffing members of the party. It will be deshelling them. It'll be stopping them. It'll be silencing them. It'll prevent them using melee attacks. It will do so many very nasty things, including poison. This is very awkward because it can swap back to phase one. And remember, it always phase changes by reducing the entire party's HP to one. While you have just literally within one second received poison on all three members. And I equipped all kinds of stuff to figure out how to bypass this. Like poison resist, but it was only 30% poison resist. So it could still land. And one thing that became very noticeable is that the... The boss's level is probably something like level 6, and our players are capped at level 4. Because debuffing with Vanille, I ended up bringing Vanille in. We even, we even upgraded her weapon to be improved debuffing too, so there's a much greater chance of her landing debuffs. Wasn't landing anything in the multiple early tries I did on this fight. Now, for all the nerds about this fight, uh, are aware that he's very susceptible to poison, but my blind playthrough, I tried Vanille debuffing this guy many times, and she never landed a single one. So I abandoned her doing that at that point. For those of you who might want to be typing around in the comments about what to do here. Now, this is all fine. I could play around this. I could plan a technique where I use Dispelga to get rid of all the uh, poisons as we're transitioning. So, because the problem was, if, you, they, if any of them had poison, they would instantly die when we moved to the next phase. So, there are ways of playing around it. And you could, if you were very fast with the buttons, you could deal with it. It was tricky, but you could do it. The problem I had here, and this is where some of you, are, I, I, I don't know whether you're telling the truth or whether you're just misremembering it. <clears throat> But I'll tell you now, because I know there's some people here who've played this game a billion times and read about it a bunch online and done all sorts of stuff. I will say I give massive thanks to the people out there who were quite upfront about the fact that this boss either stopped them playing the game entirely or they ended up wiping on it like 50 or so times. Like, I totally get that. I understand it. This, this next thing I'm going to talk about is why it's a 0 out of 10. When you Libra it, which is finding out what the, you know, scan, it's finding out what the debuff potential of the boss is, what it's immune to, what its weaknesses are, what its strengths are, and it also gives you notes in FF13, uh, which you need a patch to see, by the way. Just to remind you, the notes that you need for these bosses only work on PC if you've got a third-party fix to show them. So bear that in mind, if I hadn't got the fix and been told about this, I wouldn't have seen any of the notes. Um... It tells you this boss is capable of one hit killing you. That's it. That's the only message you get. And I'm saying that because it was very obvious there was a lot of people who thought they read a different message and then remembered that they're not sure where they got the message from. Or they understood the mechanic. Essentially, once you go through two phases, then it cycles back. It now adds death to its arsenal. And learn what i could and i am extremely good at learning mechanics i have made a career out of learning mechanics and an esports caster based on picking up mechanics visually and what's going on could not figure this out and essentially it just casts death on someone and they die that includes the main played character which means yes if you're understanding anything about this is if the other team members of your three die, you can res them. But if you die, it's game over. Which means several attempts, the boss just casted death on me and stopped the fight. 
right out of the blue. So my brain got worrying. We have no gear whatsoever that can prevent death. Nothing whatsoever. Uh, we tried the tank mechanic, which says any hit that will kill you will restore you to... Instead, you'll be left at 1 HP. It, death is not technically damaged, so it bypasses that mechanic, so we couldn't use that either. I was throwing everything but the kitchen sink at this, and the only ideas that made sense to me at the time were that it was based on HP. Like, either percentage remaining HP, because I was like, there must be a, a rhyme or reason to this. Because not even the dumbest game developer in the world would make a boss that's, you know, 20 to 25 minutes long and make it so that at any point after the first three minutes, you can be randomly killed and game over. That's just so stupid. So obviously there's something here, and that I was aware of. There's some something here that makes this doable. And I was watching HP values, I was looking at percentages, I was trying to remember it in the middle of a very intense fight and get all these things done. Ultimately, I, a solution presented itself that was outside of the idea, uh, what I was trying to solve. I kind of got lucky. In that I realized after like three or four pulls, my Sentinel, which was Fang, wasn't really doing anything. None of the mechanics are tankable. So occasionally she would just be tanking. At best, she was able to bait debuffs onto her, which isn't particularly helpful because I have to remove them anyway. So that's not helpful. So she wasn't really providing anything of substance. So I was like, okay, well, who's best to bring in her place then? Because we can't actually tank uh, some of these mechanics. So what can we do? And it dawned on me that I would really like haste because this boss has so much HP. And having some buffs up would allow us to not heal as much. So I thought Saz is the man. Let's get Saz in. Saz has haste. He has braver. He has shell. He has protect. He has faith. He has veil. He has all these buffs that he can put on us. And so I brought Saz in primarily to just increase DPS output. And also in a pinch allow us to do like a double commando ravager play for even more damage during the stagger windows. Um inadvertently this upped our chance of just not being hit by death and so in the pull i killed it which was shot was, was like two pulls after i think i tried this besides a couple of scuffed pulls where i literally was like too slow on the opener and it killed us i think we killed this in like five tries something like that um it just didn't hit me <laughs> it did land a couple of times but it landed on vanille uh, and I was like, oh, okay, uh, uh, but that'll do, right? I didn't know why it was happening, but it is what it is. So I just want to say, any any boss that has a mechanic like this and doesn't make it abundantly clear as to how the mechanic works or provide you with some item that you can at least protect the main character with is a 0 out of 10. Because the actual mechanic, as I now know, is that it only targets people, uh, sentinels or healers. That's what it works. It will not target commandos or ravagers or and synergists or saboteurs. It targets them. Some people are going to claim, which was definitely seen, that they obviously realize this straight away. I have no doubt some people guessed that this is the idea, and you did guess because there is nothing in the game that points to this, uh, that that happened. Or you figured it out later or read it in a guide in a magazine or something like that. Not to, that it's one of those two things. You either got really lucky with your guess or, or you read it later on and maybe you think you knew it because there's nothing in the game that indicates this. And this mechanic does not come up any earlier in the main story campaign. Um, what I will say <clears throat> um, on the back of this is that now uh, the, the sad thing about it is I might have noticed this if it wasn't for the case of you have to paradigm shift constantly during this fight. You have to do a ton of paradigm shifting. And there are definitely things you could have done to probably ignore this mechanic. Like if you played the synergist or whatever or the saboteur and you were like spamming death on the boss or poison on the boss because you were controlling say vanille you would never have been affected by this and you would have ignored this mechanic entirely now it just so happens i really detested playing those i liked playing commando i liked playing ravager i didn't like playing sentinel so all those things counted against me here but either way no there should have been something in the game or on the libra notes that tells you about this thing or an item that prevents death that you get earlier on in the story that's in a pretty prominent place because I picked up most loot, man, uh, that you can get. I, that so yes, despite what you're probably typing right now, I give this a zero out of ten just on that because it was just it was frustrating and pointless, uh, and the the feeling of being like RNG'd out of the fight was not fun. Uh, moving on then, then proceeds. <laughs> uh, 
for those of you who played FF14 and have done coils, a very similar cutscene to what happens with the twins uh, all the way back then and Louis Soir is the most friendship is uh, friendship is whatever cutscene ever. It's so odd what happens here. I'm going to try and talk you through it. Is we defeat Orphan. But Orphan is still alive. Orphan is now rabbiting on and talking about things and blah, blah, blah. And like, you've kind of, you feel like you've done what Orphan wanted to do. Defeated Orphan, right? So now Orphan is like, you must become Ragnarok. Fulfill the prophecy. And everyone's like, no, we won't do that. We're here to save Cocoon. Oh, except for Fang. I think in general, this destroyed Fang for me a little bit. Although I get it. I totally get it. This isn't complicated. It just wasn't right it was almost like I, I compared it to a bit to like the daenerys targaryen twist at the end of game of thrones um fang decides that she's going to fulfill the task she's going to do it and in doing so she goes to like attack and beat vanille you know her roommate or friend or whatever you want to call uh until the rest of them get in her way and hold her back but she gets they get blasted away and they at that point, because of the intensity and all that, they then become Seath. So the entire team becomes Seath, and they pile onto Fang. They, like, literally dive all over her and are beating her down, except for Vanille, who's still around. And at that point, she becomes Ragnarok, uh, which is a smallish, like, fire monster, and goes to stop Orphan and fulfill what Orphan wanted. But Orphan puts a shield up, which is odd instead of allowing Fang in her rage to actually unleash on Orphan. Uh, she tears through the shield and... Uh, <sighs> then she stops with Vanille, like, interfering with it. And she... And then the weirdest thing happens. There's... She just stops doing what she's doing. And turns around. And everybody's back again from being a Seath. They're back to normal. And then proceeds to have like a five minute heart to heart conversation where they play through all the memories of what they've done along this journey together. And we, I'm like, it's often just like chilling now. But no, Orphan's like burst into flames at this point. Like she like murdered him, but we didn't really see that. But Orphan is like dying. And they're all stood around just having this wonderful like, hey, we did it. And like, even if Orphan has died now, Aren't we crashing into the planet? <laughs> As Orphan's like burning in the background or AFK just watching what's going on. Uh, and these guys just decide to have this big pally pally heart to heart. So strange. Uh, and then we turn back to Orphan who is indeed dying. This cutscene I would say is 15 to 17 minutes long of all this happening, going through everybody's memories of when they first met, the hardships they've been through. It just feels so out of place and so bizarre. And then when we come back, there's another boss fight. Orphan's not dead. Orphan rises again. <laughs> to become Ragnarok, you must end. Do give us, grant us that which we have been denied, which is a swift death. So we have another boss fight. Now, thank I was dreading this after certainly going through the last one. It's like, oh my God, not again. And you really have a 17 minute cutscene between this. It is a gimmick fight, thankfully. Uh, it's a gimmick fight. If Assuming you have Tri Disaster as one of your paradigms, which I did not. Uh, so I, I, we wiped once, swapped to Tri Disaster, and you kill it immediately. You just absolutely melt it into the floor. Then the ending happens. <laughs> the ending of FF13-1. Okay. So... <laughs> <sighs> it C cocoon shockingly starts falling out of the sky and it shows that the, the evacuation is not complete so people are gonna die and then it goes on about wishes do come true but you have to make wishes happen and what's about to happen is the most final fantasy get out of jail free card ever uh, certainly the i hope bex can show it on the screen the most elaborate cutscene ever to show what happened here so all the friends are falling but they're falling close to each other so they all hold hands like guardians of the galaxy however fang and vanille are missing and then we look and fang and vanille are holding each other's hands and they're separate from the group and then fang and vanille <laughs> become ragnarok together 
uh, through some reason, although previously we did apparently need Orphan for them to convert to Ragnarok, but now they can do it sort of whenever they want. Uh, so they merged to make double Ragnarok, uh, which is the power of both of them together. Previously, Ragnarok struggled to break Orphan's shield, but now Ragnarok has a whole bunch of new skills. <laughs> whole bunch of things as ragnarok bursts to the planet and then the duo ragnarok of um vanille and fang then make a crystal tower that surrounds and envelops cocoon and s catches it as they swirl around in some sort of goo with lava and encase cocoon in some sort of way and cocoon is saved wishes do come true don't they apparently like there's nothing in the game that indicates this can happen it's just absurd um and i remember looking on in just absolute shock of like what is going on here and like why what this is <laughs> there's nothing in the game that indicate this can happen uh so I, I, either way cocoon is saved wonderful absolutely awesome because and i get what they're going for and again this comes back to what we talked about last episode is people like oh you just don't understand it i totally understand it is the ragnarok could be a force for good or a force for bad i get it it's just there's nothing in the game that remotely indicates that this is possible at all in any way it's just so out of left field and absurd and ridiculous uh, certainly after we've just seen the power of ragnarok in action and it was kind of crap to be honest <laughs> it's kind of crap and they had no plan for this they didn't know but now they know they can hold hands and they can become duo ragnarok and blah 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 and, and as the the story kind of comes to a, a crescendo here the curtain closes is we see all the friends have lost their tattoos they're no longer the seas and then somehow <laughs> finding them in the desert uh sarah and daj are there hello so that's a lovely return as we get um saz gets his son back and snow gets his fiance back and lightning gets her sister back and that's all well and good and then it shows that the new heart of cocoon inside the crystal is the perpetually crystallized fang and vanille facing each other holding hands for i guess the remainder of eternity but they can still talk to us because they talk to the protagonists at the end they're just chit chatting with them so they're still around doing stuff which is great the end fades to black <laughs> the end i was just like where the hell did this come from this is so ridiculous like that everybody should be dead that's what should be happening but okay it's final fantasy we're having a big wacky ending all right i just didn't like it that let me just sum it up like that i didn't like it i got it i understood it i just didn't like it there's nothing if you're gone we talked about this the suspension of disbelief if you're going to do stuff like this there should be some indication that this power exists somewhere so it's an even a thought in the player's head it's like i wonder if they could do that if they combined all their power together could they do something like that and stop like a essentially a moon falling on the planet that would be cool instead of it just coming out of nowhere and being all bizarre that is our conclusion to 13 what are my overall thoughts here one this game absolutely does not deserve the hate it got coming into 13 was probably one of the most not toxic but one of the most um aggressive chat experiences of like it's horrible lightning is the worst uh, it's the detestable it's the worst game they've ever made i disagree with that i think it's a solid mid-tier game it has it has a lot of pros like the main pro of course is the combat system it is the best combat system of the ff games so far it's really good it shines very very brightly in intense fights there's a lot of player control over what is happening and man it was basically like raid leading so it really appealed to me uh the combat system's failure is that it's a little too slow in the main game doing trash mobs which is why i'm a big fan of four and six uh one and two as well and eight and twelve is that for the mobs that you're just not that interested in because you fought them a million times is you can speed the game up and just let it happen you can't do that in 13 and some of the mobs are very very difficult certainly towards the late game where you have to play them out and i would guess again looking at speed runs i probably get through the end game in about 15 minutes whereas for me it took somewhere like eight eight and a half hours 
mostly of just trash fights and picking up loot and things like that uh it's a little slow there but in boss fights it shines so brightly it really really does uh, but 13 also has the worst crafting and talent system like its talent system wants desperately to be ff10s which is the best one they've ever done ff10's sphere grid is phenomenally good uh this isn't that it's very over designed it's over elaborate um and it's and, and at its core it's really just a series of next uh, waypoints uh, checkpoints on the way to the next level um it's actually an incredibly basic basic system but it's tried and i assume they figured it was basic but it, it looks a lot of things in ff13 are designed first practicality later uh nothing is nothing is more clear than that than the summons the eidolons they are utterly pointless as far as i'm concerned uh i'm sure they have some niche uses somewhere but the summons and the eidolons absolutely pointless a complete waste of time and probably in response to ff12's limit break system which is yeah it's it's got problems right it's not perfect although it can be funny um but it also takes up a lot of screen real estate of watching all those animations and rolling and things like that uh so they probably in response to that they turn them down but they're useless their damage is infinitesimal compared to the players just playing you can res from it but you can also do that for way cheaper with renew uh it's like three tech bars to summon something or one to just res everybody there's not really a, a question there of what you want to do uh so renew is like a never-ending megalix so it's really good <laughs> it's really awesome uh so like i see no point in that that's a shame because they're very well designed they've got this like gundam mech feel to them very cool uh it's end game is just a grind so that's got so it's got its like, pros and cons the story i actually enjoyed a lot like i know a lot of people think like the story is very complicated it's not or that i didn't enjoy the story i did i did i just kind of suspected along the way that it was going to resolve in a bizarre manner and it did uh to tie everything together because ultimately the plot the story of final fantasy 13 1 is flawed in premise and that's a big issue and this is something we've been we've been working on something in the background that we have a story related to it and the first question that came up when we were talking as a team about the story is that while well, this ending that we have planned it doesn't quite logically fit like why would x and y do this like that doesn't make any sense and from the very beginning the idea of killing orphan in any way shape or form is just a bad idea like there's no getting around that it's a bad idea alternatives should have been looked into or something should have been set up in the game in order to give some sense as to why these people would even risk destroying or murdering everybody in cocoon because the idea is to save cocoon but they're totally okay with killing orphan which is the one thing it's kind of like we want to save the death star but at the same time we're gonna shoot through this portal and we're pretty sure it should hopefully work out okay for some reason <laughs> right it's just it's nonsensical uh like that's not what you would do and that is the, the the situation they wrote themselves into it's just flawed from the start and it's not got anything in the middle to sort of repair that gaping hole uh going through it but overall the story i enjoyed i like i love the idea of the propaganda that was going on the manipulation of the gods the fact that the pulse is long dead uh and they're still being fed this information i would have liked something about human curiosity human curiosity is a factor that's often played into the best of the best stories is that you can't have a hundred percent control of a populace it's not possible it never has happened in human history and there's good reason for it is human inquisitiveness and curiosity is too real if you tell people even the, with the threat that they would die that you can't go to this place people will go a hundred percent of the time they will find a way to get there it will always happen every single time there's a reason people have summited everest there's a reason people want to dive to the bottom of the ocean despite the fact that you could die very very easily and you're being told that doing this is a bad idea is curiosity trumps every time i would love to have seen that explored more with the people of cocoon because you can't control 100% of a populace. It's just not realistic. Uh, so I would have loved some stuff like that. But overall, I liked it. Uh, a lot of people have asked for my character tier list. So I'll give it to you now. My number one character from T uh, Final Fantasy thirteen base game. Final Fantasy thirteen one, one whatever you want to call it. Number one is Saz. I loved Saz all the way through. He's the most realistic and uh, empathetic character in the game. He acts logically nearly all the time. We can ignore the... If you ignore the chocobo that lives in his head uh on his hair i should say uh he's the one who responds exactly as somebody would do in most scenarios uh like he was great he was grounded he was exactly what i needed um 
Number two, and I know people don't like this, but it is true, is Lightning. Lightning was great. Besides the stupid name, and, and ultimately we find out she's called Claire, um, Lightning makes a lot of sense. An angry soldier who has had everything like bullied out of her and her sister's now been taken to this big Chadamus, you know, Chadicus Bradicus kind of character uh, to uh, who's taken the hand of a young sister that she feels very protective of and now her sister's been um, hurt. And, you know, like that's uh, all fits. Lightning's motivations... Besides the weird moment with Hope where she sort of gives up, which is early game, um, overall, Lightning was exactly as she needed to be. My next one will definitely upset you, but hear me out on this. Uh, my next one is Snow. This was a tough decision to come to when we were actually talking about this. I appreciate the fact that Snow is who he is from the start, and he's fully on board with that ride. Do I want to be friends with Snow? No not at all like absolutely not but snow is as you take him and he has some character development which is for the positive and that happens with hope just before they reach hope's home in uh, cocoon is that he's he knows he's full of shit and bravado it's all a front he's aware of that but for him the prospect of losing is too much to bear and therefore he's going to do his best and be the hero because people need a hero and he knows that and he's right people do need a hero they want someone to look for look look up to and they want somebody who might lead them out of things he's not going to get it right lightning is a clearly a better leader but he will do his best and if he has to pick up and get everybody moving again he does this multiple times in the games like we need to get going we need to push forward we need to keep going snow does that as i said would i be friends with him no uh but it is what it is. Uh, next is probably a tie between Vanille and Fang. It would usually be Fang, uh, although the ending of the ending of the story with Fang, I think, moved her character down a peg or two. Actually, Fang would probably have fallen in second place uh, ordinarily. I liked Fang. She was straight up. She was. Uh, she had someone to protect. She went about that. She gave counterpoints, which were reasonable and logical. Uh, for the most part, she she did her bit of not having a memory. She had amnesia, but she knew that she needed to help. That's why she's part of the cavalry earlier on with Sid. Like, her character was fine. Her character was really fine. But the ending stuff where she goes to, like, attack or kill Vanille, become Ragnarok, it, it, it just didn't fit. Uh, they needed somebody to do it, I guess. It, it needed to be Fang or Vanille because they were the old Ragnaroks. But I, it didn't work out for me. So she dropped down a pick or two. Vanille... Vanille is somebody, uh, again, I actually liked most of the characters. To be, There's no character I really disliked besides Hope. Hope is last, as you obviously aware. Uh, I didn't like Hope uh, at all. I, I know he's supposed to be 14, but he's the most immature, ridiculous 14-year-old ever. My my 8 uh, my eight and 10-year-olds are more mature than Hope now. It's uh, it, His whole character arc is a, a loser, essentially. Um, his name is very ironic. There's a weird moment where, at the end of the game where Hope, uh, Daj and Sarah come back and Hope, like, runs up to see if his mother's back and he realizes she's not. <laughs> uh, unlucky. Uh, but his, his arc is not great and he never rises. Uh, with a name like Hope, I was kind of expecting him to become the focal point of the story. But it turns out, no, Hope really doesn't have much in the way of Hope. Uh, and keeps chipping in with these ridiculous comments. Like, just not a fan of that character. Uh, when it comes to Vanille, I loved Vanille at the start. She was my number one. I really liked Vanille. Because I know people like Vanille with relentless positivity, with a lot of anger and bitterness bubbling below the surface. To the point where they kind of poison themselves. Uh, you'll probably know people like this who need... They'll say things like, I need positive vibes around me all the time. Like, I don't in, don't bring your negativity near me, like that kind of thing. And I'm relentlessly positive, even in the face of abject danger. Um, but it, I, as you guys should probably be aware by now, unless you're new, is characters that relentlessly tell lies that are, are almost to the point, uh, or are at the point of completely illogical and pointless, just don't sit well with me. Um, I really dislike liars in real life, like, very, very much. Like, I, I don't have time for it. I don't like it. Uh, even if you're trying to do me a favor by lying, uh, you're not doing me a favor. Like, nearly, there's very rare times that lying to me, unless it's, like, something fun, like, we're going to have a surprise party so we didn't tell you. That's not what I'm talking about. But lying about important things means I just can't trust you. I and mean, that's just, that's the nature of the beast. I, I People in my life I need to be able to trust and that behavior i don't like at all and it drags a character down for me but other than that 
Vanille was my number one character, but she lies. Nearly everything she says is a lie. <laughs> of importance. I kind of feel like she was used way too much to have twists and turns in the story. So they have this character who's trying desperate and i believe me i understand i'm trying desperately to protect other people but in doing so she just endlessly makes things worse and i don't like that i don't like that characteristic so there it is my friends ff13 is done uh, i'm not letting you know now where it falls in my tier list of the games because we have just one more to go yes we do of all the single player games one through 16 just one remains final fantasy 5 is the finale and after that, for those of you who keep asking, after that, we will be doing Rebirth, which has just come out on the PS5. And after that, then we will look into 10-2, 13-2, 13-3, Tactics, you know, spin-offs and things like that. That's, we're doing all the base games first, then we're going to that. All right, so thank you so much for being along for this journey. I hope you enjoyed Final Fantasy 13. I certainly did. Does not deserve the hate it gets. I had a fun time, and I'll see you again. Bye, guys.